Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I'm Evgeny Karam. I will be the moderator in the first State of Cybersecurity Industry panel brought to you by Cybits. Joining us today, cybersecurity influencer and Forbes writer, Chuck Brooks. Thank you, Evgeny. It's a real pleasure to be here, and thank you to Cybits too. Innovative creator of digital bill of material and one of the first commercial firewall products, Chris Blask. Thanks, Evgeny. Nice to be here. Cybit's co-founder and CTO, Dimitri Reidman. Evgeny, happy to be here. Today, we are going to discuss relevant cybersecurity topics addressed by United States President Joe Biden in executive order on improving the nation's cybersecurity. We have planned six topics for today, and then we'll hear questions from the audience. This is a live event, so please use YouTube chat to ask your questions. Before we begin, on May 12, 2021, only several days after the colonial pipeline attack, the US government announced an executive order designed to strengthen government cybersecurity defenses in the wake of several major recent hacks, which impacted numerous federal agencies and private companies. There were several key elements, such as multi-factor authentication, software transparency, protection of IoT devices, EDR, vulnerability management, and disclosure of breaches. So let's begin. In your opinion, what motivated the government to create executive order? Well, I think there are a variety of factors. And, and first I wanna say that, you know, cybersecurity is unusual because it really has strong bipartisan support. It's not really a political issue in the sense of other issues. So the, the agenda already was being set by past administrations in building on what they needed to do. And it started earlier with uh, supply chain orders uh, and other executive orders that, that called attention to the, the, the targeting of all these breaches. But I think what motivated uh, this administration was really uh, two breaches, big breaches, solar winds, primarily a supply chain breach and, and a lot of lateral problems inside the systems still going on. And then what you mentioned earlier, the Colonial Pipeline, um, where it took down a you know, good percentage of the East Coast oil supply. And I think we have to realize that, uh, that this was in, in, in the works in this executive order really changes the paradigm from reactive to preventive. And that's really important. And the, mention, the aspects you mentioned are really integral to it. And I think it really is a, a down payment on our, our cybersecurity for the future. Chris, Dimitri? I agree. You know, as Chuck says, this lines up across multiple administrations. You know, this is not uh, a one-off. It's not a fad. You know, this is a long-term trend. You know, it goes to things that Chuck and I and others have been working on uh, uh, for decades now. We have a need to be able to see what's inside things. Uh, now, the, there is no way it was created in a few days about Colonial Pipeline. There's like 18 pages of, of the document. So it probably was in the works. I'm guessing, and it was mentioned before as well on the internet, it's probably started in November last year. What do you guys think? Well, I think personally, it's been in the works, uh, a collaborative. A lot of the same people that are in this administration are the same people that are in the previous administrations, particularly in the, the Department of Homeland Security apparatus. And there's a lot of outside influences like the Cyrus Space Solarium and others have made these suggestions. And these suggestions have been around. And I think they're looking for, you know, a, basically a framework to implement them. Uh, there's a lot of pronouncements that have happened in, in, in the past. But, you know, and, and that's why I said the, the, the Colonial Pipeline thing was just, you know, this is, you know, enough is enough. We really need to, to push it to the front. So I think, you know, that it's not that it's new, it's but it was, it was pushed forward by that uh, incident. There's a lot of milestones in the executive order. And a lot of them mention 60 days, 90 days. There's also mention of ESBOM. And I know, Chris, you've been working on ESBOM for quite a long time. So the government gave NTIA 60 days to figure out what is the minimum as bomb level, I guess, should be. Can you elaborate more? What do you think it's mean? How it's possible even and realistic to have? Sure, and it is, you know, multiple call outs in this, you know, so Kate Stewart has been running the uh, SPDX uh, project at the Linux Foundation for 10 years now. Um, Alan Friedman at, the, at NTA in the Department of Commerce, as you mentioned, has been doing a great job for about three years now, um, hurting this group of us cats. And there's enough of a workable understanding in that group of what this, you know, what needs to be an S bomb. Um, Alan and the other folks are taking the input of, of the community. You know, as we all, we all like to uh, uh, criticize ourselves and our nation, our government, our corporations, and whatnot. But 
this is an example of the the working groups and cooperation that come when it, it's time to get things done you know as you say enough is enough you know in the last year and a half we've had colonial pipeline the suez canal a pandemic you know any number of other reasons to to look closely at this you know and the well, while the details of this executive order or any executive order are, are important and worth looking at, particularly if they impact you directly, if you're looking at the long change, the fact that this executive order and the one from February 24th and several from the last administration, two very different administrations, really follow the same path. You know, we will provide uh, visibility in, in the SBOM case into, for example, what code is running inside of the things that control the grid and our hospitals and so forth. And we're now at this point where the forcing function of an S bomb with, as you say, a 60 day limit, you know, for will we'll force the, the working groups uh, um, to enunciate exactly what they mean. And through the rest of this year and next year, we'll try those things out and, and where we're wrong, they'll evolve. But this is this is driving the evolution. Yeah, so basically, I think there's if we start in May 12, we only have a couple of weeks left for the NTIA to do this. I hope it's a realistic milestone or it's going to be an extension was going to be a version one of, of, of uh, I guess, the document. Can you maybe talk about this? What do you think will happen? Well, I, I, I think you're right. I expect a, a version one, you know, and, and anyone familiar with any sort of, you know, long process like this, you know, that, that, that's what you expect. I think the so software bill of materials, so let's talk about the content here for a second. A software bill of materials is a document that says inside my software, there, there is this stuff, right? And all software contains other software and links and libraries and open source. So that's what we need. We need that document. Now, how can I prove with, it? How can I prove it? You know, I can write anything I, anything I want. And it, as you break this down, you, know, you take SBOM and DBOM. So DBOM is an attestation ecosystem. And one can stand up a node, they can involve themselves in channels, and they can agree to deal with other people or not. And we find a lot of this is what we do already. You know, companies buy and sell from each other and they promise things and they tell each other things all the time now where organizations decide to be honest or dishonest you know that works out for them better or worse over time so if but if you have a trust relationship with a source and as as Cybeats folks know there are ways to take you know a binary for example and look at it and say i think this is the software inside and if that doesn't match what you know an, an s-bomb from a vendor uh, tells you then perhaps there's a difference and perhaps they're missing something. So we'll, 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 we'll all work through it. So we will have companies and products that will help validate what do you write in ASBOM. So I'm wondering how it will change the products and the way people design IoT devices in the next 12 to 18 months. So I think that first and foremost, where we'll see the changes is the in the procurement levels and procurement contracts, right? And they will probably require more greater transparency from their supply chain. And whenever it comes to devices or software or anything else that's been procured by especially a government related bodies, right? The level of the transparency, that's kind of what these SBOM requirements are, right? Because ASBOM might be many things and can have many different meanings to many different people from one side asbom can be the sources that your application or your device is built from on the other hand that might be the binary that i'm actually selling so you as end user as a downstream a consumer of that specific software you want to know that whatever was uh, used to build the software is authentic right and the software that is built and you got it is authentic and then when you operating the software and deploying it, you also want to come back and recheck the software that's running on your servers, or you want to make sure that whatever you have in your facilities connected to your network, it's still the same thing that you got from the beginning with. And one of the issues that we have seen, and I think that was one of the great motivation behind this executive order, is actually the software supply chain that we have seen related to SolarWinds. And you know, if you're looking at any organization that's building a software product today, there are multiple points that can be attacked and usually they are not being protected as well as the rest of the organization. So one of the, these locations is actually the source itself, right? And you can either 
you know, take over the developer workstation and push some malicious source on his behalf without him noticing. If you don't have the proper gates and checks in your process to stop that or review such pushes of code, you you actually you know getting malicious code being called as a part of the product. Then attacker can compromise the source control. He can compromise the build platform that builds it right, and then just replace the software that's been built with his malicious piece of the software that does whatever the software is supposed to do. But there is some little extra that been added, and that's kind of the malicious code that can wreak havoc on systems. And then of course there's the packaging right when it's been packaged and been shared. With end users, when you're getting a source, actually, when you're getting a software today, you're downloading it from somewhere, from a server, or it's been sent to you by email or by other means. But how you actually checking that whatever you downloading is is exactly what what you expecting it to be? There is of course different type of methods, and that's exactly what Asbom approach helps to to overcome. The other thing that uh, we are seeing is that there will be some disruption in the market from perspective of licensing and open source software. Now, once we asking a greater transparency about, you know, about the, the ingredients of the software that we're getting, we actually also will get inherently information about open sources. And in some cases, companies concerned to share that because they don't have a good hygiene for open source libraries that they have used. So now suddenly, if they expose this information, they could be uh, in trouble of uh, infringing some type of uh, open source licenses. And uh, if someone doesn't have proper governance internally in the organization, they will have to close the gaps very quickly. And in some cases, uh, undergo very large redesigns of their products or solutions. Chris, I see, I see you want to add, add something here. Right. He, uh, uh, you know, Dmitry said it right at the beginning, policy and contract language, right? You know, if you're my customer and you say thou shalt, you know, give me an SBOM, I have, I have to decide if I want to keep you as a customer. And that's going to be more and more the case. And these issues of, of intellectual property control, um, there's a number of proof of concepts being uh, developed in a number of areas, uh, totally different sectors all at the same time. Again, showing that this is the time to work through these things. And what we'll see, look out for this one, as this year and next year go forward, it's less about whether you have an SBOM or not. It's more about the contract language saying that you will agree to provide me the contents, the SBOM, perhaps not even now, but under these conditions. If there's a vulnerability comes out from a reputable source that could be related to your software, you will share your SBOM with me or part of your SBOM all the way back up the supply chain. So that contract language literally does English text, better yet smart contract, uh, uh, smart co contract language text, you know, with oracles reading it in channels, um, will automate the sharing of this information and the control of the intellectual property. And we'll find looking back that we never had any control of IP at all. And through these mechanisms that develop over the next several years, we'll be able to see who we're sharing our IP with, what parts of it, and whether or not they even look at it. That'll be new. I think great points. And I, I think uh, to add to it, you know, I, I, I actually all the technical aspects that were just covered, but uh, the real uh, thematic change, I think, in this executive order is it's using the power of federal procurement to dictate how the market is going to be shaped. So they're, they're exactly right in saying that you're going to have to, uh, to to work within the rules and you're going to have to uh, do security by design up front and you're going to have to re meet these milestones. So it's a, it's a paradigm shift. And uh you know, it, it's a little bit different from what typically has been done at the Department of Homeland Security and, and other agencies where they have a public-private cooperation and they take best practices from the private sector. This is really telling uh, the private sector is that, okay, if you want to be part of our customer base, you're going to have to adhere to, to these these uh, these goals and, and follow them closely. And I think if you look at some of the other uh, aspects that are happening with the DOD and CMMC, uh, requiring, uh, you know, stronger cyber hygiene and, and other elements of overview of, of, of the cybersecurity process here, you're going to see that there's a pattern happening here. And this executive order is is really uh, pushing that home. So right now, the executive order talking about the government, I mean, everybody dealing with the government need to provide this information. 
if they need to provide this information, they may need to spend more money and time to actually create it. Would it make the products more expensive? I, I doubt it at the end of the day. I think that uh, this has been discussed at great length. All these topics have been, right? You know, and, uh, you know, the, the what Chuck just said sounds to me like conversations we've all been having for decades. At some point, this reaches reach a level of seriousness that if we, the community, you know, cybersecurity folks, wh whomever, haven't, uh, haven't fixed it, someone's going to make us. And, you know, you're exactly right. This is exactly, you know, what a, in, in the U.S. a, a federal a public-private system is, is, is for. When the public sector, you know, represented by all of us at the end of the day, say, you know, if you really want to sell into the systems that keep me alive, um, you're going to have to X, Y, Z. So now it's contents of software. Now it's software bill of materials. Um, perfect. You know, and, and like, like so many things, you and there are smart people behind this layers and layers deep, you know, an EO like this would not be coming out if it were impossible to deliver. Now I think it's going to be challenging to, to, to deliver. I expect to see some interesting moments, you know, where maybe there's an industry pushback and saying, we're not always giving you our software bill of materials, but that's, as I said a moment ago, say, all right. But if there is, you know, what are the conditions under which you will share IP? Would this make the software better? You know, whenever we're building things, whether it's software or anything else, you know, I'm a big fan of applied innovation. You know, I usually don't know what I'm doing. I'm just doing it and we'll see what happens, right? And that's how most things are built. That's very innovative and so forth. And that's how, you know, we've gotten this far with, with software to date. Um, but, you know, and that's not going away. You know, there's lots of room for innovation in, in code and always will be. But there's levels of seriousness of, of, of anything. You know, this, this is not a backyard project anymore. This is literally aircraft carriers and national grids and, 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 and. Paul F. Roberts did a great uh, uh, story just in Forbes uh, yesterday, I think, on the agriculture sector. Um, we have to have better quality of, of, of software. As it turns out, all of these systems, having software bill of materials, sharing attestations and so forth, will make us have better visibility of what it is we're doing and that they'll lend themselves better to better engineering processes and real engineering, not, not the, the, the upstart, you know, cyber engineering, but the kind of engineering that's been building bridges and, and water systems for thousands of years. You know, this will make Do you think better. the idea that people need to disclose what's inside the ingredients, they will have just because of this to write a better code and write better software because people I, will know what they're doing. Yeah, by itself, yes. And of course, this is happening in a in, in a larger field of having better visibility. You know, do you know what's going on? Do you know what you put inside this thing? And and again, it's not so much about even providing the software bill of materials; it's about knowing that you have to. You know, whether or not Sorry, you, you publish it right away, someone may knock on the door and say, "Do you know what's inside this?" And if you don't, you better clean house inside. Chuck, what do you think? Uh, no, I, I, wholeheartedly, I wholeheartedly agree to this. I mean, you you uh, you have to be more thorough in, in your preparation and your coding. Um, and, and generally, there's always uh, you know flaws and malware and all kinds of things in, in, involved when you're uh, building applications. So that alone is going to uh, reduce the, the the cyber threats because a lot of these uh, attackers are just taking advantage of of things that are already in in uh, in, in code already. So I think. This is this will be good, and and you're looking at also, you know, that you, you mentioned the fact that you know, will they, the prices go up? I don't think so. I think it's going to get more competitive because the market uh, for government is huge, um, and it's not just the market of government; it's a barometer of what others will use. So, and it's global. So I think that the, the competitors in the space will do their best to conform to the to the to putting out the best product. And I think they're also because of the transparency. If they don't, they'll be exposed. So there's a there's a reputational issue also to, to contend with. So you know, I'm I'm really uh, uh, gung ho on on this uh, you know quality improvement aspect of, of the executive order. Great. We have amazing questions coming on YouTube. So people that are listening, please add questions. We are more than happy to address them later on. Dimitri, I have a question to you. Since you're starting Savits and you breezing. IoT, NOT for I don't know how many last years. How will this change the IoT vendor, and what is what is the order will mean, and not just from the Asbom perspective, just in general. First of all, it's going to be challenging for everyone, and this uh, executive order, the way I see it, it's a, it's a, it's really a true wake up call for you know the public and the private sectors. 
many companies doing uh, their business by white labeling other companies' products. And uh, based on this executive order, they either will need their supply chain to line up with it, or there will be serious impact of their business. And uh, in some cases, actually in many cases, the thing that they will have to change and adapt is actually their process or their internal organizational process of how they do things because there is no technology or silver bullet that can solve this uh, this problem, right? They, they will have to find the right technology to help them through the type of transformations, but I don't think there there is something that they can just go and flip a switch and you know be compliant with the requirements of this order because it's so broad it requires so many things as you mentioned it's not just around s bombs or transparency of the software right it talks about many other things like edr and this morning i read it's going to be like requirement of disclosing a breach in 24 hours from the moment it happened which is uh, which is quite challenging and uh, as we as we mentioned because of all of this uh, procurement requirements, the companies will have to embrace very truly the concept of secure by design for whatever they're building. Can you explain more what does it mean for from IoT space? Like how do I design a medical device with security in mind? So let, let's let think about even, you know, the, the basic levels of uh, where are we going to source our parts from, right? Where is the chip manufactured? Who written the chip? Uh, the chip uh, operating system or the code that's running inside the chip. Or as example, when you're designing an IoT device, where are you placing your bus and data layers on the PCB, right? On the electronic board. You don't want to put them on the surface layers of the PCB. You want to bury them inside so they're hard to get to. And, you know, whoever tries to attack or reverse engineer your solution he needs to go through some layers. Like it, it's at that level, right? So that's what secure by design is. And then it goes, of course, to the software and what kind of software you're using, what kind of open sources you are using, how you're building, how you're coding, are you following some uh, standards on the market when you're coding it? What kind of tools and frameworks you're using? Do you have the proper uh, policies in the company to you know, to track and uh, immediately get information about new vulnerabilities affecting your software? Do you have the ability to get information, like send telemetry from the devices, right? From IoT devices and understand what happened to these devices. Do you have the ability, what, what happens if some malicious code gets into the devices, right? And uh, compromise the device, what you're doing? Is it like game over for your company or you still have some measures or something you can, you can do? Like, I'm participating in a lot of research that we are doing as part of being an IoT security company. And what we are seeing, and that's an interesting, is that every single public IP in North America been attacked between 3,000 to 22,000 times a day, right? It's, it's, it's a scary numbers by hundreds of malicious IPs. And this is something that we're recording, we're researching, we're doing a lot of research around that internally, but that's that's kind of scary statistics. And this is also why, you know, there is a motivation to include this type of uh, solutions under, under the executive order. Well, you know, there is a lot of discussions already that I can see in the industry happening about hardware security capabilities, right? Things like secure boots and trust execution enclaves for code. However, these measures, they mostly protect against secondary wave of attacks, right? The ones where attacker already landed on your system and he tries kind of to get to the root of the things, right? He already has this privileged access and now, now he tries to extract some type of uh, identification or encrypted data. But what protects the devices, as example, right, against uh, against these threat actors landing their malicious code on the devices. And that's also something that will have to change. The, the level of uh, ability to monitor, right? Have like endpoint detection, protection, and response capabilities for every single thing that connected to the internet or to the public world. So that's, that's, that's what uh, these companies and these vendors will have to think and consider about, in my opinion. 
I love IOT slash OT in this context. We use that all the time, right? But you know, and it's but it frames this conversation. OT, to be clear, operational technology. This is critical infrastructure, ships, boats, planes, rail, you know, the big stuff. IOT is your $17 camera and all this little stuff, right? And we're talking about it all at the same time. And OT gives us good examples of how we get through this. You know, because it turns out if you build national power grids and so forth, they will actually kill people. You know, in fact, these all these massive systems that have been around for, you know, you know, decades and centuries, in some cases, thousands of years, work for work very well, but imperfectly. And that's OK. You know, I love boats and the perfectly bo boat, good boat sinks all the time. But you do what you can. So we're going to have $17 cameras and so forth. That will continue. So if the solution seems to be that every IoT vendor out there suddenly has to do things that will cost more than, you know, the, the, the GDP of a small nation, that's not going to be the way it works out. Um, you can see the indications of some ways it works out. Um, you know, but again, you know, with present company, there are companies, you know, motivated to, to sell things to IoT manufacturers that help them shorten this, you know, give them the telemetry, you know, uh, uh, like a Sybeats thing or whatever. There is always going to be the, the motivations for people to to help uh, the IoT vendors get good enough, because the solution is not going to be and and going from again that that perfect frame, OT we tend to think of capital S as we put it in place for decades. IoT we think about things we literally may only use once and throw away, but you know the 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 framing of the whole thing ends up with many of the same solutions is the same visibility we need into software bill materials into the contents into the function and operation um and we're not going to count on the individual device being absolutely perfect it's going to be part of a system a system of attestations of content of state of threat intelligence so that each piece works together well enough so every every time we find ourselves going down the IoT path and imagining IoT vendors going to do things that are if they're too onerous. We have to diverge from that because you know they will do what they're capable of. Yeah, let me add to that. I think you you hit the the really big word in all of this is visibility. And I think for any IoT uh, vendor, the first step, and that's also uh, pushed by the NIST framework, uh, that is is know what's in your system, your software, your hardware, have an inventory. So I think before you do anything, before you connect, before you create a business. In a network, you have to know what's in your system, whether it be the software, the hardware, whether your default passwords have been changed, and and what you're connected to. So I think uh, it all starts with that, and it's really a bigger, bigger issue with cybersecurity. I mean, uh, you know, that we're going to be in a in a world where there are going to be three times as many connected devices as people. Uh, I think we have to have accountability to who's using what devices and how, and what kind of security they have on those devices before we let them into our own network. You guys mentioned many different OT and IoT devices, from boats to planes to refrigerators and many like electrical grid thing, electrical grid uh, devices. What do you think right now is the most vulnerable one out there? All of the above. Do you want to elaborate a bit more? Well, it's, it's gotten to, you know, it's a target rich environment, right? You know, so on the one hand, you know, nation states have not been going to war with each other because, you know, you don't launch cyber attacks against infrastructure unless you're also going to launch missiles. But we're getting to the edge of that. You know, the, the colonial pipeline attack is, you know, one of these, I'm not saying, I'm just saying, you know, plausibly deniable, not really a nation attacking another one, but that's flirting right up against the edge. Now, can you do that with agriculture? Can you do that in the healthcare system? Can you do that um, with shipping, rail? You know, research shows that you can't. So it's less about which is more vulnerable to, you know, what are our responses should someone do something like that while we're in the process of making it so people can't do those things. We had DDoS attacks from DVRs a long time ago. Like we're talking about four or five years. So nobody's people are upset, but I guess people are getting more and more upset because of the implication of what may happen on the nation level. Right. Yeah. All of us who worked in, on uh, you know national plans and so forth here in the U.S. and elsewhere know this. I mean, you know, all of this escalates to the point where you can shut down countries and shutting. You know, the 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 uh, in Paul F., uh, Roberts uh, uh, Forbes piece he talks about a denial of sustenance attack. It turns out that's not new. You know, d denying sustenance to your opponent, you know, is something that goes back thousands of years. Now, in any sort of modern conflict, you know, would, you know, 
hacking the food supply system of a nation be part of a an active conflict i don't see why not right you know so we're again th these executive orders from countries like the united states don't happen in a vacuum pr particularly not a series of them that line up you know we were edging towards uh, international uh, realms where countries need to be very thoughtful about both, you know, how they defend themselves and and what their responses are to these things. I have a feeling that uh, majority of the companies will try to provide the ASBOM privately and not publicly because they will be concerned. I think Dimitri mentioned this part that other people, like competitors, will see how they build the code, or potentially they know using an open source code, they may try to influence or change the other code to impact or get into the company. This speaks again to the multiple sources of validation. You know, so having an, a software bill of materials from somewhere is great. It's a good start. Maybe maybe get one from another source so you know what's inside things. Watch things as as they're in as they're running in, in operations. The you know and and the, the sharing of information. Watch your you know we're we're going through a global pandemic now. The the analogies are not lost on those those of us who think about cybersecurity. But be you know be careful who you're touching. What are your relationships? What's your contract language? How do you know? You're dealing with reputable sources today, you know, do those things better. So, but, the, but, you know, as, as I've said, I think software bill of materials particularly won't always be sh as shared and as public as the first blush thinks. What I think we'll tend to see is software bill of materials and similar attestations about IP will be conditionally shared based on contract language and agreement. I'd like to add into the, the most vulnerable uh, system networks because uh, I think we had a case study this year with all the attacks on our healthcare uh, under COVID-19. Um, they were rampant uh, phishing attacks, ransomware attacks up almost 300 percent. And there's a reason for that because that industry, first of all, did not invest in security. They're operating with a lot of disparate networks and devices, uh, particularly IoT devices, you know, medical devices and networks of doctors and nurses and patients. So they're easy pickings, particularly for criminal hackers. And now that they can get uh, paid through cryptocurrency and, and extort, uh, it, it became a hot item. And uh, so I think, you know, if we look at that industry and, and look at the case studies of what happened and why we can bolster, uh, you know, future elements, uh, particularly uh, with other industries. Uh, and also, uh, you know, the thing worries me most, I think still is a grid. It's still built, most of it was built in the seventies. It is another, uh, area where there's a lot of opportunity with legacy systems and vulnerabilities and and, and the implications of something did happen in a, in a serious critical infrastructure attack, I think we'd be paying a, a very serious price. Yeah, I also want to add something to it. And uh, I think that probably the grids and the water treatment facilities, which are in the headlines these days, they're the most vulnerable systems out there. Of course, we, we cannot survive, we cannot uh, keep our day to day without the system up and running 24 seven. One of the issues there is uh, the window of exposure. Uh, when there is an exploited vulnerability in the field, it's very hard to take the systems down and patch them, even if you want it. If someone uh, you know, shuts them down, then either lives will be at risk or we all gonna feel it, right? And we have seen it at the, as part of the colonial pipeline attack. So that's probably the first to protect, right? And that's part of the critical infrastructure systems. The other ones are, as uh, Chuck and Chris mentioned, they're medical devices. Many of these devices running like on Windows 7 and Windows XP that are out of support completely and... Great, we have many questions coming from the audience. So let's bring some of them. Chuck, you mentioned about CMMC. So we have a questions from Peter about CMMC and if you guys think it will go to the rest of the government as well. Um, I do. I mean, already uh, Department of Homeland Security said they're going to use those same requirements. It's still uh, uh, in process and they're still uh, determining what's going to be used and what's not going to be used. And it's in test case. So there are a few companies now doing it um, in actual projects. But I, I think the way the government works, you know, it's split in, into the security DOD IC area and, and then the civilian, which is led by, by DHS. And once the DHS leads the civilian, I think they're gonna probably require the other agencies, which they're responsible for monitoring uh, security uh, to implement the CMMC too. So another question is coming from Guy. So if a vendor want to comply with the executive order, what should be their first steps? 
and I guess it could be in any cases, it could be EDR, vulnerability management, micro segmentation, multi-factor authentication. So we may have different answers here. Well, you know, th thinking about, if, you know, there's a lot going on here, but I'm thinking about all this in the, in the software bill of material context. So if you're a vendor and you don't know what SBOMs are, now, now is the time to educate yourself. Um, if you do what they are, you know, then now is the time to put a plan in place. Uh, I've been working with a number of vendors, you know, large and small. You know, some of the biggest uh, vendors out there, you know, have been working for the last 12 to 18 months. I'm putting an SBOM uh, uh, plan in place. So, yeah, uh, my recommendation is display diligence. You know, re read the actual EO, look at what is requiring of you and downstream and upstream of you, and start thinking through the steps to create and consume S bombs um, and the relationships, the contract language specifically, the policies between you and other supply chain actors to support those. I would uh, I would also add uh, that. It's, uh, it would, would be great to look into automation, right? And uh, try to identify if all your processes are automated and they are error prone, human error, or anyone that could interfere in this process and start developing metrics around these processes. There's also a good point of uh, following some uh, industry standards, right? And uh, then you, know, you, you need to identify the one that's relevant for your specific uh, market, right? So if you are uh, medical device, uh, building medical devices, then you probably want to follow the FDA regulation for the pre-market, for the post-market and the, the submission, etc. If you are in critical infrastructure, then you have, if in North America, you have the NERC C. If you are in Europe, you have the IC62443. So definitely identify the right thing for you and follow the best practices. Once you understand the, of course, before even getting there, I would say that you know, before even getting to doing something about it, first of all, identify your gaps, right? So make the proper assessment, understand where you are today, what are the gaps that you want to bridge over, and then start uh, looking for solutions or, you know, which might be internal or external solutions to your organization. So here's an interesting question that I think is very, very relevant to ASBO. As we all know, when you contract a person to create a software for you, you don't really know who they have, who they outsource, and the person who they outsource, who they outsource, it could be like a chain of people that wrote something. And it could be a very interesting discussion. Like if this can be addressed with ASBOM, would it be addressed with ASBOM or it need to be addressed in a different way? Right. You know, so I'll, I'll state my bias on this. You know, so I've been thinking nodes and channels and attestation ecosystems 24 hours a day for two years. And this to me is a DBOM question. And, and this, again, comes back to those relationships. You know, if I'm buying something from you and think about this for a second, if you, we take SBOM to mean that everybody who ever gets or uses or sells a piece of software is going to provide the SBOM with it. Can you just imagine, you know, I don't, I don't think most organizations have the disk space to store the S-bombs related to all the software they have. So it's not about everybody telling everybody everything all the bloody time. It's about saying that if I'm going to buy this from you, then I trust you, I'm fine. And if something, you know, under these conditions, I will want more. You know, there's a great use case we did in the D-bomb consortium on a, on a following up a metal bracket, you know, through its manufacturing into use into failure and what happens right now. And what happens now is, you know, the metal brackets holding a camera over a highway, it falls and kills somebody. And over the course of 12 to 24 months, all sorts of people produce all sorts of records in court. And we can solve that by setting up smart contracts and attestation channels so that when the, you know, if it fails, you will provide the information about this one thing immediately and automate that, right? So that it happens right away. There is no 24 months of, of lawsuits. You know, we don't have cartons of, of data and files being produced in court all the bloody time, you, you agree in advance, you know, here's the relationship, should, you know, what we agreed, you know, happen or not happen, whatever the relationship you can put together up your chain, that's when you get that visibility. So to, to the, the uh, Isabella, to your question, you know, at that fine point, and this is where I get really excited because the basic infrastructure of SBOMs and nodes and channels and attestations, you know, to me has gotten really pedantic and boring. It's how we work with it, how we get into the edges. You know, it'll be fascinating to see how this works out. So I think it can be done. Well, I just add, I think it's exactly right. I think maybe that also is going to probably be more important now than it was in the past is, is the automation of software testing. 
uh, you know, for, for uh, code problems. Uh, so the behavioral aspects of it too. Um, a lot of the algorithms being developed now with machine learning and artificial intelligence could impact on that area. And it get, goes again again to the visibility issue of what's in in your network, what's in your code, what's in your system. And I think that if we, it comes down to a security first perspective, and so I, I, I'm excited to see it go in this direction. Thank you, Isabella. We have a question from Manny. It's an interesting one. So yes, government trying to have more transparency. And I guess the, the ultimate questions, how much is enough? Right, and, you know, and this is one of the ancient questions, the perennial questions, right? You know, um, you know, we joke about this a lot, you know, in cybersecurity, but it's true enough. You know, assume the adversary already has all this information. They tend to, right? And, you know, they may not necessarily be true in every case, literally of every piece of information, but unless you know they don't, they probably do. And it is better to assume that way. So the security through obscurity, you know, while it does have some uses, it's a funny world, isn't that great a plan? It, you know, and, and empirically, it's just not working out really well for us. So having transparency, and as I keep reiterating here, it's, I don't think that, you know, we're on an, an inevitability curve, things are going to happen. And they include that there will be transparency provided, and that not everybody's going to provide transparency to everybody else all the time. Right? So it's, you know, we're, we're walking down a step. First thing uh, with the transparency and that everyone will benefit from is transparency to yourself. That's organization, right? Who you know, <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You will discover and unveil a lot of things that you will figure out. Oh, wow, that's uh, that's how we do it today. That's already will accelerate, right? The the improvement of your software, of your solutions, right? You'll build more resilient things, more resilient products as uh, as a result of it. And then, you know, if you will embrace it, then it would be very easy to you uh, to be transparent here, right? Like just be transparent completely and you, 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 you would be kind of future proof with whatever you're building and whatever your product is. I have another question. Then I think we can reference it in a bit different. How the executive orders that right now is focusing on the government, but probably in a six months a year will go to financial sectors to the banks what do you think they need to do or how is it you should start thinking about this how to adopt it as well as you know many uh, large banks have enormous software bases of their own you know some of the big banks have more programmers than microsoft so in and you see um down this diligence path in the financial space people working on the attestations about the CICD pipelines inside their company. Do we know, you know, to Dimitri's point, do we know ourselves? Do we know who is touching our own code and internally and where it's coming from and whatnot? That's a very good diligence path. will be supported by, by others in the industry. And come again to contract language. You know, look at the regulations, look at the, the, the structures that, you, that, you're, that you're regulated by, you're, that you're controlled by, and look to the questions you're asking of those who supply you things. You know, are you, are you, saying to them that if you're going to provide me systems, you will let me know what's inside them. You know, will you provide SBOMs? And and lastly, you know, a number of issues here, but work out ways to consume those. This information coming in from vendors, you know, what do you do with that when that gets inside? And that's there's developing fields and folks like these who can help you with that. Yeah, I agree. I think that, that one of the, the things that it, the, the executive order is a two-way street and the financial industry has really been ahead of the game compared to most others, particularly to government and particularly in state and local government. So they've, they've already invested heavily in these areas and there's lessons to be learned. There's been a reluctance to share outside of their, their industry. And I think one of the things that the executive order will do, it'll bring uh, disparate industries together to share uh, what tools are working, uh, um, how you have a visit, better visibility into your, your, your products and also the training and, and threat intelligence particularly. Uh, threat intelligence is, is really one of the areas where I think the, the financial community excels uh, because it had to. They have to know uh, who's trying to steal their money and, and, and getting into the, their, their accounts. So they've done a lot of, uh, hired a lot of good people out of, out of the intelligence community, out of FBI, uh, other agencies. And, and I think they're, they're a good, uh, good uh, uh, pathway to look for in, in, in terms of this executive order. Zero trust and ZTNA, and in general, was mentioned multiple and multiple times in the executive order. 
and I think it's like one of these magical acronyms that people use a lot lately. In your perspective, how would the world evolve? And I also want to hear maybe how it evolve in OT and IoT space. So I'll, I'll, I'll uh, pull up the Wayback Machine, right? This, this is this is firewall question 101. You know, is, is it allow by default or deny by default? You know, am I specifically, you know, um, saying I like you, I like you, don't know you? Or am I saying I kind of like everybody and I'm not sure who I don't like? Um, so zero trust is just another way to say those same things, you know, that you don't start by trusting anything in particular, um, you, but you build that trust out. So in these, in this context, things like, you know, I just come up a number, number of times in this conversation and, and does in every one of these, uh, every conversation like this, uh, this, these days, you know, how do I know that the SBOM somebody is sending me is real? Well, do I know who I'm buying my software from? Do I? have you know do i know that they're financially viable they've been around for a while do i know anything about them if not then i probably have procurement issues as well uh so you know at, at the you know zero each of these acronyms and names and tags we give to things you know quite often turns into things you know and zero trust architectures and products everybody's got them these days um may work in a, in a lot of wonderful ways but i think it's a perfect example in this space and I'll, and I'll end with, you know, I touched on a couple of things that the, the uh, Global Semiconductor Alliance has an IP working group uh, public uh, activity going on right now is a perfect example of this, where the chip vendors themselves have come to realize they, they are sharing information already, like like uh, Chuck pointed about the banks, and they're going to do more and they're going to do ass bombs and so forth. So, you know, you know, there's, there's no trust exercise like working with your competitors to see if your trust models are good. Actually, Evgeny, uh, I think that it would be interesting to turn the table around and uh, maybe hear your opinion on this question. Okay. <laughs> Since we are all working from home, not all, but majority of us working from home for the last almost 18 months, unfortunately, and basically the way we need to authenticate ourselves or create rules is relying a lot on who we are or maybe from where we're coming, like the device itself and not the IP, I feel personally that we will have more IAM identity access management place in zero trust. Who you are, from where you're coming, what if the device is compliant. And we will create a lot of the rules using zero trust like this. If I want to connect back to my our infrastructure or my data center, I will want to check who you are, multi-factor authentication, a potential check from what kind of device you're coming, if it's a compliant device or not compliant device. By compliant, I mean if it's a part of Active Directory, it's a part of domain, or it has an MDM installed. Or if I'm going to the internet, I may provide you access to browse based on from where you're coming as well. So I think we will have much more identity base of zero trust and slowly, slowly, actually we're kind of there, but not fully on the behavior part, depend on what I do and how, how I do it in the internet, my zero trust rules may change. So if you're getting even so fully authenticated, downloading too many files in irregular hours, it may kick in something that will change how I can connect or what I can do. We have more questions here and some, some of them are very, very good guys. Thank you very much for the questions and the interaction. Kirk, you ask an interesting questions about infrastructure as a service. So we have the three giants, AWS, GCP and Azure, and they do quite a lot. And the question, I guess here, would they provide as bomb as well? I think the short answer is yes. You know, so they'll have to decide whether they want to sell it all into those yeah, we're here, we're here talking about an executive order. So we're doing regulated industries. So if you as an integrator or a solution provider are using somebody else's stuff and they don't want to provide S bombs that are required, they've just decided not to be in that market. So they will uh, provide them. The S bomb itself, it also has a, a depth. So it's, it depends what is the depth of this S bomb that you require. Because when you get to some point, for example, with AWS, as, as you mentioned, there is different type of certification that they are going through, right? And you have different type of, uh, of uh, trust. And there's like basic principle component, components that have been used in your design. So, for example, like if you're using Greengrass or using uh, DynamoDB or you're using 
a lambda execution uh, or lambda runtime environment in your design that's that's again that could be your kind of lower level building blocks for your s that you're providing when you're describing your service so eventually you know to your customers you're selling them a SaaS server service however there is underlying building blocks for the service which would be part of your code part of libraries you have used however there will also be infrastructure related or infrastructure as a code related components there as well as the SBOM. And again, it, it depends how deep you want to dive as part of your SBOM description. Because there are only three of them, I'm wondering if they say we don't want to provide it. Like in the beginning of AWS, they didn't want to change any contracts, they didn't want to kind of play ball with the big companies. Would they be able to force themselves because people have so much infrastructure already there? Well, right. This this touches on some of the, my earlier comments. You know, I I I think I believe I believe I see very clearly what's going to happen in the in the short term here. What interests me is that slightly longer term. So, what's going to happen in the short term are things like this. You know, I haven't seen it yet, and and frankly, in the big players, I think they're all sort of lining up down this path, anyways. But you know, we'll have situations where somebody says, "Okay, you give me these S bombs," and someone else is going to say, "Now, no," and and have a good point. Right. And that's when we get into the back and forth and say, all right, I can understand that, you know, but you have to agree that if the U.S. cert comes out with a vulnerability that says, gosh, that might be you and you're in me, there's going to come a point. I'm going to I'm going to get access to that information as and as you just said, Dimitri, that's the next step. And I'll tell you the state of evolution. Only this month have I had multiple people in different conversations bring up the the, the issue of, of partial S bombs, because, yes, you know, when it comes time to share that. It may be that all you really get access to is part of that individual document, that indiv individual S bomb. You know, perfectly reasonable. But we're just starting to work through these things. So we'll see these back, we'll see in the media headlines and saying, you know, company pushes back. But that's just an artifact of this, you know, big negotiation we're all going through. Thank you. So we have questions from Gary. If I already purchase a software and I've been using the software for a long time, do I recreatively go and asking for Asbom from the vendor? Do I ask it for I need to renew the license or buy more hardware? Uh, again, sort of all of the above. This gets talked about an awful lot. Um, I think there will be ecosystems of, of, of folks, you know, developing Asbom's for existing uh, uh, stuff. And, uh, you know, and you mentioned software and hardware as well. So. You know, there's, there's a lot of bombs flying around. We're all talking about software build materials right now. It's good to get that when, you know, solid in our heads. Just imagine it's a document, it's a Word document, whatever it is. It's saying in this software are these things. Now, a hardware build materials is talking about the hardware. And then you have things like in toto, um, the, the question from the banks, uh, uh, in toto is about the custody of, of software. You know, so we have all these different attestations about things. And, you know, but an existing in installation of a piece of hardware with with software on it has a history and people who touched it and did things to it. So something as simple as just an S bomb that may or may not represent what was originally on that system seven years ago is is interesting, but it's not the whole thing. So no, you're not gonna have to run and get one because that's not not, not the solution by itself. Guys, thank you for all the good questions. I think we are done with the questions. Let's just double click to check. Yep. Thank you, everybody, for joining today for the State of Cybersecurity Industry Panel. It was amazing to have you guys here as a panelist and amazing questions from the audience as well. Please remember to subscribe, and we're going to have many, many more uh, panelists and questions like this and, uh, I guess, more interaction with the people. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, folks.